The Lord be with you. As you're turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 13th chapter of Luke, I want to thank Sean and the choir. I just want to thank you all. Luke chapter 13 is where we are this morning, beginning verse 10, reading through verse 17. Luke chapter 13, beginning there with verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, we pray for ears to hear. Ears that hear your words and not mine. Eyes to see what you have for us and not the things we put in the way. Hearts open to receive your call that we may listen and obey. So be with us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Eighteen years. That's a long time to do anything. It's a long time to own a car. My Uncle Jerry has owned the same Cutlass Supreme since he was in high school. It's blue, or it used to be blue, and then it was white. I think it's blue again some point when I was in high school, he decided that Cutlass Supreme wasn't good enough. He needed a Cutlass Supreme 442. Anybody know what that is? Raise your hand. The rest of you go home and Google it. <laughs> he bought the fake hood with the little twist down keepers. When he finally got married to my Aunt Lisa, she backed it right into their brick mailbox. So now it's blue again. <laughs> He's had that. He's had the same F100, actually, since high school, though now it's a lot higher on bigger tires. Eighteen years is a long time to keep a car. It's a long time to keep a pair of pants. I'm not sure if I have a pair of pants I've had for 18 years. But there are some shirts I pull out of the closet and I can't remember where I got them when I bought them. It's a long time to use the same lawnmower. But dad, my dad, my uncle, my cousin finally told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, your dad went and did it and I didn't know what he was talking about. He said he bought a brand new riding lawnmower. He said, I didn't know Dad knew they made them brand new. <laughs> but he did. He bought a brand new Husqvarna lawnmower. Had the same one. We put it together with baling wire and scraps for so long. 18 years. That's a long time. It's a long time to do the same job. Especially these days. To work for the same company, yes, but to do the same job? It's a long time. Eighteen years is a long time to do anything. It can especially be a long time to wait. I can remember when I was a kid being told that once I turned 18, I had waited long enough, that I'd be an adult, that I'd be free to move out of the house, although I'm sure my mom and stepdad probably would have said a little bit earlier if they had their way. I was free to get a real job, to join the military, to vote, maybe get a loan, although in Alabama you couldn't buy cigarettes till you're 19, you couldn't buy alcohol till you're 21. I was able to do all sorts of other grown-up things after 18 years. Even when I was 12 and 18 was just six years away, that seemed like a century to me. 
So I can imagine 18 years is a long time to wait. Because I'm sure the 16 years between Return of the Jedi and The Phantom Menace felt like forever. (laughs) You better believe 18 years can sound like a lifetime when you're in the courtroom and the gavel falls. And the sentence comes down to 18 years. Measured out in hash marks scratched on a cinder block wall. 18 years is a long time to have to do anything. It's a long time to have to wait. It's a long time to have to be stooped over, unable to stand up straight. That's how long Luke tells us this nameless woman in our text this morning had, was suffering with this crippling spirit. Eighteen years. For eighteen years, she learned the sight of her friends and her family, not by their face, but by their feet. For 18 years, she recognized where she was going, not by landmarks and monuments, but by the cracks in the pavement, the places where the ground was worn smooth. For 18 years, she had been racked with pain, unable to stand and greet her loved ones with a hug, unable to look another person in the eye. For 18 years, she was stooped over. Children would have grown up and had their own children in those days. Friends would have died. People would have moved in and out of her life. For 18 years, she suffered through the pain. And to you and I, that may not sound like a long time. But in a day when there was a much lower life expectancy, 18 years could have been half her life, easily. Stooped over in pain. Unable to stand. That's a long time to wait. Eighteen years is a long time to wait for a healing rabbi to show up at the synagogue. But that's about how long it took before Jesus showed up one day to teach in her local synagogue that Sabbath day. I wonder wonder if they had a sign like ours out front. Maybe on it this Shabbat, special guest rabbi Jesus of Nazareth, bring a friend, cover dish to follow. I wonder... I wonder if maybe it had made the gossip circles, you know. Jesus, Jesus is going to be at the synagogue on the Sabbath. Yeah, I heard about what he's been doing. Maybe we should all go over there and watch. Maybe we should go listen and have a look. Good. Maybe they said, because I'm not sure I can sit through another one of Rabbi Chris's sermons. We need to have a visiting preacher. I wonder if Jesus just showed up on the Sabbath and was asked to teach. I know that's how some small old churches do it. In fact, when y'all sang the anchor holds this morning, it reminded me in my home church, uh, anytime uh, um, Phil and Audrey would show up, it didn't matter what we were going to sing, uh, Miss Kay, our music director, would ask Phil to sing the anchor holds every time he showed up. I wonder. Maybe, maybe the rabbi of that synagogue saw Jesus and his disciples come in, sit in the back, and then during the announcement said, Jesus, Jesus, would you come up here? Would you, we'd like to hear a word from, from Mary's son. Jesus, can you give the lesson this morning? I wonder. I'm not really sure how it came to be, but my guess is that this wasn't this woman's first time in the synagogue. She was no curious passerby sticking her crippled neck in the door to see what was going on. No, it's very likely that this woman had been a regular there. And she was surely a regular in the community, if not in the synagogue. In fact, I wouldn't doubt if the people in that community knew her as that woman who was always bent over. The woman with the bent back. That means for at least 18 years, this woman had darkened the door of that synagogue. For 18 years, folks in that community had done business with her, had crossed paths with her in the streets, and they had seen her in the marketplaces and other spots around the community. For 18 years, this woman had lived and been a part of this community, and though I don't doubt that folks kept their distance. After all, she had a spirit, Luke tells us. And folks with spirits in those days weren't the kind of folks that good religious people were supposed to be around. So I imagine that Sabbath, this woman came in, 
took a seat in the back where all the other women sat, a place where women could be seen sometimes but never heard, never acknowledged. And I imagine she stared at the ground, trying to strain towards the sound of the rabbi's voice would inevitably cause cramps, cricks, and all sorts of pain. So maybe with her back bent, she bubbled in the letters of her hymnal, scratched out a grocery list on the back of the bulletin, I don't know. But I'm quite sure it startled her when Jesus called out her name. Just as I'm sure it would you if I called yours out right now. A name unfortunately forgotten by the time Luke hears this story. I do wonder though what went through her mind when he said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. In that brief moment, did she think to herself, Who, who, who is this? Who is this guy who thinks he can erase 18 years of pain in a matter of mere moments? You have the same thing, right? Back's been bothering you for years. You go to the doctor. Oh, yeah, just a simple, simple surgery and it'll be all over. Don't you, don't you get a little skeptical? Don't you? When your knee's been popping and cricking every time you go up the stairs, been doing it for years, doc says, oh, yeah, yeah, we can fix it with just a little therapy. No, no matter of time. Don't you get just a little, little skeptical? Who is this? She doesn't have long to ask those sorts of questions before Luke tells us Jesus put his hands on her and immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. Now, now I can hear all the thoughts bouncing around that synagogue, can't you? When Jesus does this, she stands right up, starts praising God. Oh, some of them, I'm sure, praise God, hallelujah, that woman done got saved and got whole, it's a miracle. But I can hear others. You know, it was probably staged. You know, I don't think I've ever seen her before anyway. It's fake. I saw her at Walmart yesterday buying shampoo off the top shelf. Somebody probably even say, you know, I saw that episode of Dateline where they exposed miracle healers planting somebody in the audience, getting a little take of the offering. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there were believers and doubters in that synagogue that morning, just as there always are any time the Spirit of God moves. But one thing I do know is when Jesus did this, when he put his hands on her and immediately she stood up straight, the religious folks didn't like it one bit. Luke says the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. What an odd thing to say. Seriously, listen to 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 how he says it to the crowd. There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath. He's mad. Who's he mad at? Who is this rabbi indignant towards? I mean, it sounds to me he addresses the crowd. He's mad at them. Maybe he's mad at the woman. There are six days on which to be healed. You should have came then. He's mad at Jesus. Healing on the Sabbath, it's against the rules. He's mad at everybody. Why? Because healing took place on the Sabbath. When there are obviously six other days for such a thing to be taken care of. He, in effect, says, come back when we're not having church if you want to be cured. Don't bother us with your needing to be free from this spirit of oppression on this holy day when we come together to celebrate our freedom from a spirit of oppression under the Egyptians or the Babylonians. Come back when we're allowed to heal you. When our religion doesn't prevent us from making you whole again. I can't help but think that there was... Even a thought or two that sounded something like, you know, you know, she's been bent over for 18 years and now, now all of a sudden, she can't wait until Monday to get cured. She's got to come on the Sabbath, make a scene of it, you know. Why is the leader of the synagogue so ill? What's really caused him to be indignant? Perhaps he was genuinely upset that the Sabbath laws had been broken. And I can understand that. Rules are rules for a reason. 
especially religious rules. We have to keep the Sabbath holy, after all. God rested for work on the Sabbath, shouldn't we? Who are we to say we're better than God that we should work and God should rest? But I have to tell you, as a minister, I'm often shocked by the contradictory nature of those sentiments among some church folks who want to have all sorts of services, all sorts of meetings, all sorts of practices, all sorts of events on Sundays, on the one hand, and then claim Sunday as the Christian Sabbath, a day of rest and worship. But on the other, they jam it so full of activities that their feet don't touch the ground from flying all around on Sunday. I knew a man who got up early on Sunday morning, he drove the church bus, he taught Sunday school, he sang in the choir, he drove the bus after church, he took the college kids to lunch, he took the church bus that afternoon to get folks there for the mid-afternoon meeting, took it back to take them home, took them back to come to church. He never went home on the Sabbath. It was, in a way, the same thing folks had done to the Sabbath in Jesus' day. But instead of multiple services, instead of bus routes, committees, and choirs, There was the work of non-work. The tediousness of being sure not to do anything that might be considered work on the Sabbath, lest one incur the wrath of arresting God. A person had to keep track of their steps on the Sabbath, being sure not to exceed the minimum number of steps required to be considered work. One had to be mindful of the chores one did, how much weight one carried, and some of us are more concerned about that even not on the Sabbath. You even had to keep track of how many words you said on the Sabbath. And on and on the Shabbat laws went. It became work just to make sure you weren't working. So I can understand. I really can. I can understand if the leader of the synagogue was indignant because he really felt the Sabbath was being broken. Just as I can understand when church folks can get upset when Sunday school has to be canceled because of weather, when services are called off because the power went out. It doesn't mean either of them are right. But I can understand it. Or maybe, maybe the leader of the synagogue was just offended. We think folks get offended easily these days, but it's a, it's a part of the human condition. Maybe he was offended that this woman had been bent by the Spirit for 18 years and is only now coming to be healed by the visiting rabbi. I could understand that, being offended when the work you feel called to do is done by someone else on your turf. Well, I remember preaching in the evening service at a church in Colbert County when I was in college. And at the end of the service, at the invitation, a young man walked up the aisle and asked to be baptized and to join the church. After the service, the pastor had taken me and one of the other guys from Sanford out to dinner at a McDonald's. It was a real fancy place. And the whole time, he complained. Why didn't he come up during the morning service? He's been visiting our church for months. Why has he got to come up tonight? Why couldn't he come up in the morning service, you know, when he was preaching? This woman in the synagogue had been crippled for 18 years. Why didn't she come to see the rabbi? Didn't she believe he could heal her? If she was a woman of faith, she would have known You don't get healed on the Sabbath. Hang on till Sunday morning. But to come by any other day, that's when you're supposed to do it. Maybe the leader of the synagogue was just offended, hurt that he didn't get to be the one to bring healing to a member of his community, of his congregation, but instead had to be a spectator to her healing by the visiting rabbi and on the Sabbath, no less. Maybe. Maybe. But I think there's something else behind his indignation. I think he was angry. I think he was jealous. But really, I think he was afraid. After all, that's what happens when our comfortable faith gives way to the unpredictable working of God's Spirit. When we're so convinced that we've got it the right way and we've got it figured out, that we've got the key, that we've got the answer, that only the right things, we know all the right things to do. And then Jesus jumps in and breaks it all up. Christ bursts out and bursts us out of our comfortable religion that keeps us in control, that allows us to be the definers of Sabbath 
and the writers of rules. No healing on the Sabbath? Why? Jesus says, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give water? Are you saying, Jesus says, that a donkey is more valuable than this woman, your sister? Do you really believe God cares more about your ox getting a drink of water on Saturday than this woman being made whole? I'd be afraid to hear their answer. Now, we may think it's an obvious decision, right? Of course. Of course we should heal a woman on the Sabbath if we're going to water our livestock. But what if the question was posed a little differently? What if it wasn't focused around Sabbath and healing and watering cows and donkeys? What if if you'd send money to feed a dog in in a shelter, would you send money to feed a starving child? What about a Muslim child? What about their parents? Would you take time to play with your own children? Yeah. What about children who don't have any parents? What about children, children who in the time you spend with them can be more filled with screams of frustration than laughter and joy? If you'd gladly give to a religious nonprofit for disaster relief, would you give to a secular nonprofit that's actively helping to bring clean water to villages around the world that don't have it? You see, friends, I've found that sometimes I'm not too unlike the leader of the synagogue in Luke's gospel. In this story, I tend to grow protective of my religion to the point of missing the forest for the trees. The temptation to be too concerned about man-made religious rules, regulations, practices, policies, procedures, limits, laws, and outlines, of getting too caught up in settling up the boundaries of who's in and who's out to realize that we're called to love all people, not just the ones that we've drawn our religious circles around. And sometimes it seems that folks can allow too much religion to get in the way of Jesus. In the way of what Jesus actually calls us to do. Some folks argue about what church services are supposed to look like. Do you have singing on the wall? Do you have a praise band? Do you have a choir? Do you do it at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock? Too often politics gets mixed in with our religion so much that people can't tell them apart anymore. And worst of all, they can't tell that they're missing the point altogether. Some decide that love can be defined as threats of damnation and self-righteousness. That compassion is a weakness. That hospitality is only reserved for those who have already met the minimum requirements. And I am becoming more and more convinced that so many Christians behave this way because we are afraid. Afraid that the others we view as less worthy, as less honorable, less deserving, more reckless, more careless, more wicked, more sinful, dirtier, poorer, lower than us, could possibly be loved with the same unconditional love from Christ with which we are loved. And it just drives some folks crazy to think about it. Heck, it drives me crazy to think about it. Those folks, them too, Jesus, that woman bent over 18 years, come in here, make a spectacle of the whole thing, she too, That's really what's so controversial about the cross, about the gospel. Not that it keeps out the folks who ought to be kept out, but that the love of God welcomes all. That's what makes the synagogue leader indignant. The crippled woman with the spirit, she's made whole. She's not chastised for showing up on the Sabbath to seek healing. It's in the Torah. Come back tomorrow. We'll be glad to heal you tomorrow. No. She's made whole right then. That's what made the other religious religious leaders of Jesus' day so angry. The prostitutes? Jesus? Yeah, yeah, they're in. The tax collectors? Jesus? Yeah, yeah, they're saved. The Gentiles? Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're reconciled. The cursed? 
The downtrodden, the Sabbath breakers, the meek, the poor, the lazy, the blind, the sorry, the old, the young, the women, the children, Jesus. Yeah. All of them. They're in. Then where does it stop, Jesus? Where do we have the line? When does all of this grace, love, and joy come to an end? You know what happens? You know what happens every time I ask Jesus that? You know what I hear every time I ask Christ saying to me? Every time I ask him, when does it end? When do I get to say that I've loved enough? Do you know what he answers? Any day but today. Any day but today. And do you know what he tells me the next day? Any day but today. It doesn't matter if it's the Sabbath. It doesn't matter if it's a Sunday morning. It doesn't matter if it's in the wee hours of a Friday night. When, Jesus? Any day but today. And he tells me that every single day. Because in the end, there's not a single one of us, not a single one of our neighbors, not a single human being made in the image of God, not a single one who isn't better than a donkey, not a single soul who is above another, and not a single one outside of the love of God and the salvation that Christ has come to offer us all. When's it over, Jesus? Jesus. Any day but today. And he's saying it today to us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come to you now, we pray for you to speak to us. To show us, Lord, who it is you call us to be. Lord, we know we come with our own, our own baggage, our own broken hearts, our own broken laws. Lord, just like that woman who came on the Sabbath, bent and broken, we come to you now. Lord, we know, we know that whatever laws, whatever rules, whatever sins we've committed in our lives. They are made straight and whole by your love, even here this morning. So, Lord, call us to you. Help us to see, Lord, who it is you would have us to be. And move in our presence, Holy Spirit, that we may respond to what it is you're calling us to do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.